I'm Melissa. If you're new here, welcome. This channel is dedicated to tackling hard questions, diving into the Bible, and seeing what God says about them. And I'm pumped about this next question because it is the central theme and premise of Christianity. And it's in regards to Jesus' testimony regarding his death and resurrection. Was it a myth or a miracle? Today, I'm going to dive in deep. I've been doing some research and just listening and learning from historians and scholars who are followers of Christ and who aren't. I've been getting different perspectives and yes, I'm a Christian myself, but I love to dive into hard questions like this because it challenges my faith and helps me understand why I believe what I believe. So whether you're a skeptic, a doubter, or a follower of Jesus, I invite you to join in on this discussion. And don't forget to leave any thoughts or comments down below. And with that being said, grab your Bibles and let's get started. All right, so I want to start by listing off a few statements that most historians and scholars can agree on. Dr. Mike Lycona is a New Testament scholar and historian, and he says that most can agree that Jesus existed, that he lived in Judea most of his life, that he ticked off Pharisees because of how controversial he was. He claimed to be the son of God and the Messiah that would fulfill Old Testament prophecy. He also attracted large crowds because of these amazing deeds he would perform. Some may call miracles. And so these are all facts based off of Jesus' testimony that most historians can say, yes, we can agree that he at least said these things or did these things. Whether they believe he's the son of God or not varies based off of the scholar and the historian. But we can take a step back and say, hey, most can agree that he existed, he was an extraordinary man, and he left an influential mark on history. And now I want to dive into some scripture. So we're going to start off by examining the four Gospels. These are accounts of Jesus' testimony of his death and resurrection. And what makes these four accounts so unique is that their main premise, their main goal is to convince the reader that what actually happened is true. And they want to tell the reader, hey, you should believe this too. And this is why. And I'm going to read a few verses from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John regarding the crucifixion and then unpack them a little bit. So let's start with Matthew 27, 54 through 56. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was a son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Now moving on to Mark 15, 38 through 41, it gives a similar testimony. It says, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Luke 23, 44 through 49 also says something similar about the centurion. It says, the centurion seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. And now for John 19, 34 through 37, what I love about John's account is that he tells the reader, hey, this is why I want you to believe because I am an eyewitness. I was there and this is true. Jesus actually died on the cross and I saw him there. I saw him crucified. It says, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. John wrote this account in the third person, but he's basically saying, hey, I was there, I believe, and this is why you should too, which I think makes this passage so unique. What I love about these verses is that they talk about this centurion. A centurion was someone who was not afraid of fear. They supervised crucifixions. They oversaw about a hundred soldiers and they lived their lives killing people, fighting. They weren't afraid of anything. They were brave warriors. And at this moment in time, when he saw Jesus die on the cross and take his last breath, he said, surely he was the son of God. He was terrified. He didn't know what to even make of this. He was under Pontius Pilate, so he wasn't someone who believed Jesus to be the Son of God, 
But when he saw Jesus died, he thought to himself, this man is not an ordinary man. There's something spiritual about this moment. Whether he was just a righteous man or the son of God, I think this centurion was trying to figure that out. But at the end of the day, there was something about the crucifixion that stood out to this centurion. And remember, he witnessed a ton of crucifixions. So this is something that wasn't out of the ordinary for him. What I love about these passages is that they also say that not only was the centurion witnessing this, but many, many people were gathered together. There were women there. There were so many eyewitnesses that saw Jesus die. Former investigative journalist and atheist turned Christian Lee Strobel, I recommend his books. He wrote The Case for Christ, which I actually read. He has a very unique testimony, and he also talks about four proofs for Jesus' death and resurrection. And as an investigative journalist, he spent two years trying to debunk the fact that Jesus actually died. He thought Jesus was just a historical figure that lived his life but wasn't the son of God. And so by the end of it, he came to realize, wow, there is so much evidence for Jesus' death and resurrection. And he said to himself, I would have to have more faith being an atheist than I would being a Christian. And he listed off four proofs of the resurrection. And this is also in the case for Christ. I will leave the resources that I found down below. But first of all, he says, Jesus was dead after crucifixion. There has never been any record of anyone ever surviving a full Roman crucifixion. He also wrote about the Journal of the American Medical Association, which published a peer reviewed scientific study of the evidence for the death of Jesus. And this is what they said. Clearly, the weight of the evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. Even atheist Gerd Ludemann said, historically, it's indisputable that Jesus was dead. Now, moving on to early accounts for his resurrection, Lee Strobel says that we have preserved for us a creed of the earliest Christian church, a creed that is an eyewitness report of the resurrection of Jesus. This creed has been dated back by scholars to within months of Jesus' death. It was preserved by Paul, and you can read it in 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 3. He also says the empty tomb. Even in the gospel accounts, the opponents of Jesus admitted the tomb was empty and accused the disciples of stealing his body, which was so ironic. So they didn't even see a body there, and they didn't even know what to make of it. Lee Strobel then continues to mention eyewitness accounts for Jesus' death and resurrection. He says that ancient history typically comes from one or two sources of information, However, with Jesus' testimony, it's different because we have no fewer than nine ancient sources inside and outside the New Testament confirming and corroborating that the disciples encountered the risen Christ. Now, there are other skeptics and doubters who say that Jesus was a mythical character or that he never existed. However, like I previously mentioned, we have at least nine ancient sources talking about Jesus one of them being Josephus. He was a Jewish scholar and historian. He was born around AD 37, and there were two accounts where he wrote about Jesus. One in regards to the stoning of James, his brother. It says that James was the brother of Jesus, and another account talking about Jesus' death on the cross. Now, many scholars can agree that Josephus did acknowledge that Jesus existed, that he lived, that he had a brother, but there are some that say the text regarding Jesus' crucifixion was doctored a little bit. However, it wasn't much. They say that there may have been a Christian over time that doctored the text to say he rose from the dead instead of what he actually said, which was, his disciples reported that he rose from the dead. Nevertheless, there is a well-known consensus that Josephus did acknowledge that Jesus existed. Louis Feldman was a well-known Josephus scholar, and he even wrote a book in the 1980s talking about Josephus scholarship. He was saying that many scholars do agree that Josephus mentioned Jesus. Whether they agree he mentioned him once or twice, that varies. But he says the ratio for those who do believe Josephus wrote about Jesus versus those who don't is a three to one ratio. We also have the Roman historian Tacitus. What makes his testimony unique is that he hated Christianity. He thought Christianity was evil. He thought it was a mysterious superstition. However, 
in the annals book 15 he mentions jesus christ and this is what he said christus from whom the name had its origin suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators pontius pilate tacitus had no incentive to write about Jesus because like I said, he hated Christianity, but even he acknowledged that Jesus existed. Skeptics may say that the gospels are myths influenced by legends that talk about rising and dying gods. However, if you still believe that, you have to acknowledge that Josephus wrote about Jesus, that Tacitus wrote about Jesus. There's also a Greek satirist named Lucian who wrote about Jesus. And these accounts really document that Jesus existed. You also have Paul's account. Paul has a unique testimony because he was a Pharisee persecuting Christians. And on the road to Damascus, he had this huge encounter with the risen Christ. And from then on, he changed the trajectory of his life and dedicated the rest of his life to spreading the gospel. And he preserved that creed, like I said, in 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 3. So even if you're still doubting, we still have a lot of evidence about nine ancient sources, which is way more than the average ancient history document, which has one or two sources. And in all honesty, everything takes faith. You may have doubts, you may be a skeptic, you may have questions that you're wrestling through, and maybe you think to yourself, man, I can't find an adequate answer. Whatever it may be, everything in life takes faith. On a personal note, Jesus has radically transformed and changed my life because not only do I have God's word, that's really transformed the way I see the world, but I also have a personal relationship with Jesus. Like I said, God wants to speak to us. He wants to guide us and convict us and transform our hearts. And I believe it not only because of what God's word says, not only because of what these ancient sources say, but because he is alive today, because he is communicating with us today and he has for me and he's changed my perspective. He's changed the way I deal with people I deal with my career relationships with everything and so I encourage you to ask God your hard questions as well because there's no other worldview or religion where God came down to identify with us to suffer to experience pain and to say these humans are worth it because I placed worth in their hearts and this has changed the way I see everything. And so I just really want to point you to God's word and God's truth. Like I said, I will link everything I mentioned down below so you can do your own research and just know that God wants a personal relationship with you, not because of anything you did, not because of anything you earned, but because of his grace, because of his mercy. This is something that God continues to teach me every day because I am so inadequate. And I think about our culture today, we are so self-centered. We worship the self. We see this through the selfie. We see this through social media. Last week on Easter, a senator by the name of Raphael Warnock from Georgia, he posted a tweet that said, the meaning of Easter is more transcendent than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Whether you are a Christian or not, through a commitment to helping others, we are able to save ourselves. And I thought to myself, wow, that is such a skewed view of Christianity. But this is the problem with our culture today. We've taken God out of the picture and we've made ourselves God. Instead of saying, wow, I am inadequate. I am a sinner in need of a savior. We've said, no, we don't need God. We can save ourselves. This is a very progressive, very skewed view of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And A.W. Tozer, he is a theologian and author that I've been reading lately. I've been reading his book, The Pursuit of God. He says, the self-sins are self-righteousness, self-pity, self-confidence, self-sufficiency, self-admiration, self-love, and a host of others like them. And I believe this quote just sums up why we struggle today. We struggle because we are worshiping humans we are worshiping man instead of god and c.s lewis in mere christianity also has a mic drop quote that i love to read because he basically says you either believe that jesus was a fool or that he was the son of god and i'm going to read it to you right now because i think it's so good he says either this man was and is the son of god or else a madman or something worse 
You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. That quote is so good because Jesus has this testimony. He has the word of God. He has these sources and eyewitness accounts just really documenting what he did, what he said, and what he came to fulfill. And like I said, no other worldview or religion has a God that so selflessly sacrificed himself for us, even though we don't deserve it. And so with that being said, thank you so much for watching. I hope you gained some insight in this video. Like I said, I will have all of my resources down below so you can check them out as well and do your own research. And let me know how I can pray for you this week. Don't forget to subscribe for more faith-based content as we analyze life, culture, politics, and morality through a biblical perspective and a biblical lens. And yeah, with that being said, I hope you all are having a wonderful week and I will see you all very soon for another video. Bye guys.